Alright, Privia Comrades, TF Com here. Well, I am back to my very bad camera because this is a video that may take a little longer. So I wanted to have plenty of time but long time had it on us. Um Again, this is a bad camera. I've tried cleaning it. Doesn't really change much. So I've got my light on to try to make some sort of lighting thing. I don't know. But um this is a video that's long overdue because I've I've talked about schizophrenia, I've talked about bipolar, um, and I've talked about mania, but I haven't really broken down depression that much. And there's many misconceptions about depression because you know, is it sadness? Is it this? Uh, and a lot of people say it's overdiagnosed. A lot of people say it's underdiagnosed. So it's more of, you know, what the facts are. It's more of what I need to get out. So this video I'm more of talking about the difference between depression and clinical depression. Which most people don't hear what the word depression, they think of clinical. So I'm more of doing what's the difference between the two. I'm shaking my camera every time I move. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm like have my laptop on my lap. So you know Depression in general, a lot of people think of sadness or numbness is a more common one now. But it's so much more than that. Um, when it's actual depression, you tend to, you know, something bad happened. Could even happen years ago, but it still affects you. Uh, it's be tied to PTSD or anxiety or any other mental illness and not be clinical depression and just be depression in general. And so that could be, you know, anything could have happened. Your pet could have died. Your family member could have died. Your, um, you could have not gone into the school you wanted. You know, it could have been anything. And it may have happened years and years and years ago, but it still affects you mentally. And that's slightly different, because it's more like you aren't constantly thinking about this is the bad thing that happened. But, you know, someone mentioned your school and you're just like, oh, and like down, or whatever else happened to you. And over time, you tend to get over it, but it could take years and years and years. But that is more of one that does get better over time. And typically, it's very short-lived, usually within a few weeks or so, sometimes a month. You know, it's pretty short-lived, those. Whereas clinical depression, uh, you could have the best life ever and still be upset. You could have just won the lottery, you could have had the best parents ever, you could have had everything you ever wanted for free, or had the money that you didn't have to worry about it, uh, and you're still upset. And that's a pretty big difference there. But um, my teacher phrased it, which was really great back when I was in school, uh, she phrased it as, depression is when you think of, man, things were so much better back then. Clinical depression, you can't remember a time you were happy. And that could seem like a lie, like you could have been perfectly happy in fifth grade, and if you think really hard about it, maybe you'd understand it, but you're always like, there was something, there was something wrong even then. And so, you know, that makes you wonder there. Now, when is the onset of depression, clinical depression? Typically puberty. So, due to traumatic experiences, it can happen earlier or later. And it is usually tied to traumatic experience, though it doesn't have to be. Now, clinical depression is the second most common mental illness. The most common being um, anxiety. Or clinical anxiety, I guess, if you want to go that way. Generalized anxiety disorder is the full name. But the most common is that. So the second most common is clinical depression. And with that... Girls! Shh! Girls! Sorry. Girls, you can't... You're squishing... I have a really fat rat and she's laying on the other one and it's screaming. <laughs> oh my gosh. Okay. <laughs> so, my cats are staring at me like, why were you snapping? Okay. <laughs> Sorry, it just looks really funny. Okay. Uh, yeah, I know, a serious topic, I know, my rat's being dumb. But, um, 
lost my train of thought now, sorry. But, uh, so yeah, typically at onset around puberty, their traumatic experience will make it earlier or later. And that's mostly because that's when all the hormones come in. But a lot of mental illnesses happen around puberty to your 20s. So usually somewhere around um, 12 to 25 are usually the biggest onset of most mental illnesses. Depression tends to be earlier. Schizophrenia and bipolar tend to be more in your 20s. And that's part of the brain. It's a science lesson. Um, your neurons and stuff naturally die off over time from overuse and such. And a lot of mental illnesses cause them to die faster. But when you're young, they're still replacing themselves because you make new ones up until about the end of puberty is when your body stops making new neurons, or at least it slows it down dramatically. So now that it's not having these new neurons and new happiness and new serotonin released, you're starting to feel the you're starting to feel the repercussions of it. Um, which is why, you know, the older and older they get, tends to be more issues. Like schizophrenia has a very low life expectancy. Because as you get older and older, you actually get holes in your brain from where the brain tissue has died out from just too much use. But depression tends to have a much longer life expectancy if you seek help. And that can be either through counseling or through medication. Usually they suggest you do both. And that's because it's a hormone thing. A lot of people are like, you know, why would you need medication? Well, I've, I've heard a lot of people who refuse to take medication because they're like, you know, I don't want to be like one of those crazy people. It's not a mental illness, it's something else, you know? And that is the way people view things, and that's why they don't get help as often. And there's a bad stigma around it. Even depression has a bad stigma. And that stigma is that something's wrong with you. And that, you know, everyone gets sad or depressed sometimes. Why can't you fix it? So clinical depression, you can't fix it. Again, you can have everything perfect and still be clinically depressed. So it's very much viewed in a negative light. Not nearly as much as schizophrenia, but still with a very much negative light. And the reason why medication helps, there is two main types of medication for depression, uh, SSRI and an MAOI. Now, MAOIs are very picky. Uh, you have to have a certain diet or else they don't work as well. You have to um, have a certain amount of physical activity. They're pretty picky about that, but they make it so that your brain will produce more serotonin and stuff faster, or at least then it, you know, it will start producing them again. And so it takes longer for you to feel better with them because it's not like a right away you're instantly better. It's more of you're training the body to do it again, which is why they have a certain diet to get the brain proteins it needs. You have to have um, exercise and get your brain working again. It's very much an um, interactive one where you have to work really hard to feel better. And it's not supposed to be a common one people people do. Um, I was prescribed one of those one of my first times, but it's not usually one that people prescribe, simply because it takes so much effort, and a lot of people don't want to do the effort, plain and simple. And they're usually more expensive, because it's retraining your brain. So most people don't do MAOIs, though they, are the, they have the best long-term effect, and the strongest effect, despite the fact that they take so much to get there. So that's what most people think. They want something instant to feel better. So there's the SSRIs. They block your brain from reuptaking the, um, the chemicals that already got the serotonin and stuff. And that's a pretty good one. And um, it basically makes it so that, um, you know, when you feel good, it lasts longer. So it still takes a while to feel good, but usually within a month, maybe a month and a half, you, you're back to being pretty good. Maybe not amazing, but you're starting to feel like you can actually get out of bed and do things. So that's a pretty, pretty big jump there, you know. 
And when I said that the SSRI was faster, think about that. It takes at least a month to feel better. So imagine how long the MAOI takes. Now, what do these stand for, obviously? Uh, SSRI is Selective Serotonin Reuptake Inhibitor. It inhibits the reuptake of serotonin. Pretty self-explanatory there. Now, the MAOI, Monoamine Oxidase Inhibitor, it typically, as I said, does produce more, but the reason why because of that, it keeps your body from reabsorbing the serotonin. Because once your body releases serotonin, you either reabsorb it when you're done with it, or you reuse it by reuptaking it into the system to be used at a later time. So SSRI prevents the reuptake, so you stay happy longer. But MAOI prevents it just going away completely. So it may be reuptaked, reuptake, but it will go back through your system. So it's like you won't be happy as long, but you'll be more times happy, if you get what I mean. It's like quantity versus quanti quality. Selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor, SSRI, is more about um, quality, whereas MAOI, monoamine oxidase inhibitor, is more about quantity. And, you know, in the long run, both of them can work great. Whatever is best for you. I'm not going to say you're lazy for doing an SSRI over an MAOI. Everyone's body is different. Uh, MAOI, MAOIs did not seem to help me very much, but I also didn't know you had to have a certain diet. Because they don't tell you that. They just prescribe them for you, and they usually don't tell you which one it is. They just say, here, try this one. Try Fleximol or whatever else, you know. Um, Finlaflexine is one I took. Um, there's a lot of different ones. And they'll just give them out to you, and they don't tell you which one they are. And then not until years and years and years and years of being on antidepressants and having pretty much zero effect did I realize that there's a certain diet you need to follow. And how I found that out, I found that out in college, in grad school level psychology courses. So that's why I wanted to share it with you guys because I pretty much had given up by that point. So if I hadn't learned about it, I wouldn't have, you know, given another chance. I wouldn't be better. And I now know I can't take antidepressants because of other health issues and such. But most people, depression, antidepressants help amazingly. It's kind of an umbrella term for MAOIs, SSRIs. There's also some triglycerines, uh, trigosin, uh, trilog. Glossarine, I think is how you pronounce it. Um, so there's a lot of other different ones, but they're much, much rarer. Some of them aren't legal in the U.S. yet, but SSRI and MAOI are the most common. So now you know what they do. <laughs> now, why would you need counseling? You have, your, you have your medicine. You're all better, right? Not exactly. You will go through a lot of hormonal issues. And as I said, they do take a while to take effect. So in the meantime, they want to make sure you're not killing yourself. Or hurting yourself, they want to make sure you're actually trying to get better with MAOIs. They kind of force you to get better. Like, you have to have a certain diet, exercise, you have to have everything else, certain sleep pattern, everything else. So they're more of saying, you know, like, they're talking you through, hey, did you sleep today? Did you eat today? Why don't you try to do this instead? You know, they'll talk through things, uh, to try to make sure you're on the right track so that you're actually getting some effect. They also monitor to make sure you're on the right dosage. Um, too much, an overdose could kill you, obviously. I think anything could kill you with too much. It's a lot less common on antidepressants. Usually what the issue is, is you need to get an increase. Every few months or so, your body adapts and you need to change. Also, there's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of SSRIs, MRAOIs, like there's so many of each kind. So if after a few months you're not getting much effect, they may switch you to a different one. I know for me, they would keep raising it, raising it, raising it until they're at the max they can prescribe without any complications. That's usually liver failure or liver disease. Is the, but that's typically for any pills. So don't let that turn you off. It's not an antidepressant thing. A lot of pills, if you take too high of a dose, it can cause some issues. Even, an, even antidiarrheal or ibuprofen can cause too much. And they usually cut you off way before then. Like, they may say, um, the most you can have is 10 milligrams. And really, it would take 10,000 to kill you. They just want to be really, really careful. 
they don't want to get you sick or anything else. So don't let that turn you off. If you need medication, definitely take your medication. Um, so they'll usually take it to the max they can. And if that's not working, they'll try to wean you onto something else. And that is usually the most difficult time for people. You become addicted, more or less, to this first one. And you have to basically wean off of it completely. So you're feeling horrible by the time you're weaned off. And then you have that month to get before the new one takes effect. So that's a very difficult time. We need a lot of counseling to make sure you are not doing anything drastic. Because it's clearly a time when your emotions are all over the place. You feel horrific. You just need to go on. And now, with addictions, um, people worry about that. You're taking medication, you're going to get addicted. Everything has an addiction level. I won't deny any of that. You can get addicted to chocolate, to cheese, to drugs, which is what this is. Um, but it's a lot lower than most things. Um, typically, it's pretty low rate that you won't... A lot of addictions, if you're true, like... Uh, people go to uh, AA or um, rehab for, they're typically the ones where you can die detoxing, which is when you get off of your um, drug. You can die, you can have seizures, you're falling apart, um, your body shuts down. Like That is what people think of when they think of addiction or detox. This is much, 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 much lower. You may have a stomach ache or a headache or just feel kind of bleh, like you have the flu or something. So don't be worried that you're going to, like, have a seizure or something. No, 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 no. It's not that severe. So yeah, it is an addiction because you do feel some withdrawal effects, you know, like your stomach ache or stuff. But it's not nearly as severe as a lot of people tend to make it out to be. And so now we're getting more into the medical side, but let's try to get back to the difference between clinical and um, just plain depression. I don't say plain as in if it's not warranted, it's not important. I say plain for lack of another word to use. So, big things there. Clinical, uh, I told you, typically doesn't have a reason. It can have a reason to start it. Like, um, it's pretty common after a severely traumatic experience, you develop depression. Uh, and you were just, well, you know... Basically, something happened so bad, it knocked you into regular depression. And you lasted into regular depression for so long that your body got used to it, and you developed clinical depression. So a lot, of, so it can be a pre precursor to clinical depression. Whereas your body just kind of freaks out, <laughs> for lack of a better term. Your brain freaks out and um, is trying to, you know, feel better and make new neurons and stuff, typically brains try to release all your serotonin at once, everything else, serotonin and all these other things, to, a, to bring about a flight or flight, fight or flight reflex, adrenaline and such, releasing all the hormones to do that. And so after that's done, you feel pretty bad, because you're worn out, you're tired, you may not have even done anything, but you just feel exhausted. And so your brain needs time to heal. If mentally you are not feeling okay, your brain's not healing because it's trying to figure out why do you still feel bad? I need to fix that. And they focus more on that than repairing. So it's more of, let's say, this tiny little corner of your brain. Like, let me see my camera. Where's it at? There. Right up here, let's say that's the part that has depression. You're depressed, regular depressed. And this is the part that's actually tired and needs to be fixed. Your brain will kind of ignore the part that needs that's just tired because it's not as severe as this one. This one is like demanding attention right now. You're falling apart. You want to kill yourself. You want to hurt yourself, whatever else. And so your brain's like, this one can wait. This one's really important. So it releases all your chemicals again and everything else and basically puts you in fight or flight again. And it's trying to fix the issue because it's saying put you in fight or flight give you all the energy you need to fix this issue. Go do it, human. And it's like, you don't know what to do. <laughs> uh, it's a funny way to think about it. But like, I think of that the brain is like different. Like, okay, body, I gave you everything you need. Go fix it. But, you know, sometimes you can't. Um, you can't get better. 
So some people actually have to take medications even when they're not in clinical depression. Regular depression, typically, they, they do prescribe uh, MAYs and SSRIs sometimes to sort of jump you out of it. They do it for a few months or so, sometimes a year, to get your brain used to being like, okay, now we're on a regular track, now we can focus on healing that small part, we're all back to normal, okay, we can do this. And the difference between that is clinical depression won't ever fix it. Regular depression, you know, it'll fix that area, feeling better, you know, lowering you off the medication, you're still feeling okay, you can get on with life, you're good. Clinical depression, they try to wean you off. No, 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 you're falling apart again, you're, you're broken again, you're flashbacks, everything's going bad. And they're like, oh, no, okay, let's put you back on. Uh, they're like, okay, that was not a good, <laughs> not a good. And so that's more of the thing. A lot of people are like, um, I know my grandma's boyfriend always points out, he's like, you know, they tried to give me antidepressants when my son died. I was just sad, so obviously it wasn't a big deal. You know, he's like, they they read they too much they don't diagnose depression too much because they try to give it to me. And that's what people don't seem to understand. It's, they think they're giving you antidepressants. They think you have clinical depression, and that's not the case. Uh, they're just trying to fix your issues so that your brain can repair itself. It's kind of like putting a bandaid on it, so your brain realizes, oh wait, this area is hurt too. I need to fix this area. And once that area is fixed, your brain starts going, okay. This area wasn't as bad as I thought it was. Maybe I can ease into it. And it probably is a weird analogy. You're probably not understanding what I'm talking about. But um, I like to think of it as more of your brain's dumb. I mean, that's um, if I learned anything in psychology, your brain's a moron. Your brain doesn't know what it's doing. It's falling apart. It's stupid. It's easily confused. Your brain is special. <laughs> um, there's so many times where your whole body is special. People have immune disorders. It's like, you're attacking yourself. Stop. I mean, you know, we as people know that our bodies are stupid. You know you shouldn't be depressed over something, but you are. Um, your brain freaks out and has seizures from light hitting it perfectly. Like, I have light do seizures, so like if a flashing light appears, my brain has a seizure, which means I have a seizure. Um, but it's like brain, it's like, it's like screaming, ah, there's light, I'm freaking out, and it's like, you've seen this before, <laughs> and so it's, that's a nice way to think about things, if you ever want to get a laugh, your brain's stupid, don't ever feel like it's your fault for having a mental illness, your brain's just stupid, if your brain had common sense, you probably would be no mental illnesses in the world, your brain's just dumb, sorry, <laughs> That's how a lot of illnesses, physical and mental and everything else, occur. Your brain just dumb. Which brings you to the whole thing about mental illness versus physical illness. It's a thin line. Um, I would consider all illness physical illness. Because there's an issue with hormones or a hole in your brain for schizophrenia. And all these other neurons and things like that. There's physical proof. It's not mental. Mental, they're like, oh, it's in your head. You're thinking about it. Which is a complicated thing, too, because it's in your head. Yeah, it's your brain. <laughs> um, so that's, that's a laugh there, because it's like, yeah, it, it is in your head. It's, it's your brain, you know? Um, but it's a physical thing, so it's your brain. But uh, a lot of that started because um, the history of psychology, they didn't realize that there was physical reasons why something was bad. They thought maybe it was demons in your blood. They thought it was um, all kinds of things. They thought maybe you were cursed or um, a witch. You know, a witch got you, which would be a curse. Uh, sometimes you were born with a curse. Sometimes uh, you did something bad and God is punishing you. Like, there was, they tried to find reasons when they couldn't find reasons. They tried to fix it in lobotomies and so many other torture, sheer torture, because they made someone act better. And a lot of that, you act better because your brain's so fried, you're not depressed anymore, you're nothing. 
but I'm I'm going off course here. Um, let's go back to what is depression in general. It can be a loss of appetite. It can be increased appetite. It can be a lack of sleep. It can be increased sleep. Which you know, there's always the two sides of the coin. You don't do anything normal. You either do it to ex you do it basically depression. You always do something to the extreme, whether it's too much or too little. That's a big thing to remember. It's always extreme. Um, you're very irritable is a common one. It's not one that people see as often because people know they try to hide their anger because it's not received as well. You act depressed, someone's like, oh man, you had a bad day and gave me a hug. You act angry, people are like, get on my face. You know, they don't want to deal with you. So people, especially in a lot of societies, try to hide their anger because it's not perceived well. You know, depression, people feel bad for you. Even if you don't want pity, they kind of try to help you. You know, anger, you can lose your job from being angry at a customer. You can lose your job for yelling at your boss. If you're too depressed at work, they're like, why don't you go home? So it's, it's more of like, even if you don't want the pity, it helps. But anger is a pretty common one, actually, because um, you don't understand what's going on. People want to know what's going on. They want to understand why they feel the way they do. They're angry that they don't understand. You know, they try to figure out, um, so did something happen? Uh, you know, they're trying to figure out their own minds. If someone's talking to them, they're like, what do you want? And it's like, whoa. Because, you know, you are so focused on what is wrong with you, you're not paying attention to the conversation. A lot of times you're drifting off into space. You're not really focusing on them. So, you know, you get you snap. Um, so the thing is the drifting to space. That's typically because um, your neurons are messed up. You know, they're firing weird. They're, they're not firing or whatever else the case may be. So you're kind of out, blank stare. You lose track of time. Maybe like, you're back. But it was an hour later. Typically, it's more of like a 20 minutes later or something like that. But everyone, you know, I've had where they're an hour later and you're just like, what time is it? You know, you just were so dazed out. Sometimes you're daydreaming. Sometimes it's just nothing. You don't think of anything at all. You're just sitting there. And then you're back. You usually don't even remember, remember those situations. Other times it's like you're writing a story in your head. Um, but actually, what a lot of people don't know, when you're dazed out like that where it's nothing, you are actually having a seizure. They call them mild seizures, but your brain is literally having a seizure, and that's why um, you are not thinking of anything. Plain and simple. You know, basically, you're unconscious, but not unconscious, which is why it's mild. The seizures typically, you know, you seize and then you go unconscious. This is like they forgot step two. You're not flipping out everywhere. Um, because only your brain is really having a seizure and not the physical body. So it's a little confusing there for people, but it is technically considered a seizure. So you can tell people, you're epileptic. <laughs> you have epilepsy because you daze out a lot. And I guess technically you do. Uh, I think epilepsy is not as widely, dis widely, um, it is not diagnosed as much as it should. Because technically, dazing out is is that. So a lot of people with ADD have epilepsy, if you want to get into that technicality there. But so tech, you know, so dazing out, sleeping too much, eating too much, sleeping not at all, eating not at all, um, irritability, as I said, um, tiredness is a big one for when you sleep too much. You're always exhausted. And you're like, I just slept 30 hours in a row. How am I exhausted? But your body just is exhausted. I mean, plain and simple. Uh, physical illnesses, like your stomach starts hurting. You feel sore all over. You get a headache. Um, you feel it starts off as like maybe a bad flu, and then it gets stronger and stronger and stronger. To the point where a lot of people seek out medical help. because They think there's something physically wrong with them. I was freaking out thinking I had, like, cancer, because cancer is really, really common in my family. Almost everyone in my family uh, died of cancer. Like, you know, people who have died, not people who are, 
you know, I have people alive who don't have it, but pretty much everyone in my family who has died died of cancer. Uh, typically, you know, in the lower, lower regions, whether they're ovarian or kidney or uh, prostate or uh, any sort of like intestinal cancers, typically. So that's where it hurts, you know, when you have depression. So I thought I had a cancer or something, you know. I freaked out, you know, went to doctors, went to all these different specialists, spent a lot of money, went to, like, all these different hospitals. I went to, like, I think the final count was 17 different hospitals, some of them multiple times. Went to five specialists. None of them could tell me what was wrong with me. Someone said, maybe you just need some Nexium or something. That helps with stomach pain. That's the best they could get. So obviously, you don't figure out what's wrong with you, and you think you are falling apart. Um, it's a lot less common for the hospital visits or anything else because they're expensive. I only went because I had uh, insurance. I had uh, Medicaid, which messed up. They're supposed to cover me completely, but they didn't for certain ones because the hospital didn't file right. Whatever, whatever, whatever. They're trying to say I owe a lot of money. Uh, they were a few years ago. I haven't heard from them since then, since I agreed, since I threw a big fit and said I wouldn't pay. Maybe they dropped it. Maybe they didn't. I don't know. But, um, but yeah, so it's very much, um, you have physical illnesses too. And of course, not everyone finds like the exhausting, horrible pain, you're dying feeling. But some people do. People get ulcers from your body just freaking out. They get tumors. Um, aneurysms, because your brain is stretched very thin trying to figure this issue. Uh, you get more blood clots, you can get, um, you can develop immune disorders. Because your body is so focused on the brain, they're not paying attention to anything else. It's falling apart. Oops. Uh, you can get a lot of issues, uh, more because your body's trying to piece what is wrong. They're thinking, they're like, okay, so we figured out that it's not this part of your brain. It's not this part. It's not this part. And you start, like, weeding out different areas, and they're like, maybe it's your arm that hurts. So your subconscious is what makes your arm hurt really bad, and you're just like, and it tries to fix it, and it's like, that didn't work. Maybe it's this arm that hurts. You know, it's like, your subconscious and your conscious are pretty different. Uh, like, your brain consciously is saying, maybe it's this part of your body that hurts. So your subconscious is like, hurt? Did someone say hurt? Okay. You know, again, your brain is dumb. So, your sub, you know, your subconscious brain especially, it's like, it's supposed to hurt? Oh, okay, I'll fix that. I'll make it hurt then. Good, good for me. And you're, you're like, no, I, I didn't want my arm to hurt. Thanks, thanks, brain. And your other part of the brain was like, it does hurt. This must be what's wrong. So like it doesn't piece together. It's like, it's like it's two separate things that aren't mashing very well. Uh, anxiety is a very good example for a lot of these. Uh, actually, depression and anxiety is extremely comorbid, which sounds a lot darker than it is. You hear morbid, you're like, death, destruction, whatever. Comorbid is means they're very commonly together. A large, large majority of people who have depression also have anxiety, and vice versa. Um, they are the a lot of, most mental illnesses also have depression and anxiety. But the most common is depression and anxiety mixed. And that, because you are freaking out, why am I upset, why am I upset, why am I upset? Or, you know, I, I, I try not to be, I try not to be sad. People are going to get mad at me. You know, you start developing a freaking out moment. And also it's the fact that your brain's focusing on this one part. So the fight or flight reflex is on. As I told you, it tries to kickstart adrenaline to fix itself. So, what what happens when you're constantly on edge? Anxiety. That's a very clear issue there. Um, or you can start with anxiety and be so anxious all the time that you're exhausted, you're in pain, your head hurts, and your brain is focusing so much on... Um, you are always in fight or flight. It's like, yes, this is horrible, this is horrible, this is horrible. So the other parts are neglected, and you get depression from that. And it's typically, it's just your brain can't handle everything at once. 
Um, as I said, depression is very common. I think it's, what was the official total? Something million of people have it. Um, what was the end statistic? It went away. I had, I had to look it up on my phone. But it was like 630 million people. And I don't know when that study was done. I think it was an old study. But actually, I'm going to look that back up for you guys. I don't want to give you the wrong numbers there. Uh, okay. Um... Yeah, they're saying that um, it's common as young as six years old to get depression, but more commonly 14 and older. That's more what I talked about there. Okay, come on. <laughs> it doesn't want to open the stats now, huh? It did earlier. Okay. It is 2012, so very old. Unfortunately, that's the newest that they have released because it takes so many years to study everything. They typically study again every four or so years, sometimes every six years. Yeah, I think I think it's six years for this for psychology. So they'll be doing a new one this year, hopefully, which would be great. Um, but back then, back then, as it's so far ago, there was 16 million adults who had at least one depressive episode, which when attempted suicide, typically. Uh, 7% of the population. And that's just in the United States. Yeah. Um, whereas 350 million worldwide. Oh, so I was a little high there. But 350 million worldwide have depression. 7% of the U.S. has depression. Which sounds like an insanely low number. I can understand that. Um, but when you factor in illnesses in general, a lot of disabilities like being blind are much, much lower. Let me see. Like, um... That one's not pulling up. Of course, I'm not pulling up when I'm mentioning them. Oh, um, hi, babes. Uh, okay. So think about this. 7% of the U.S. has depression. Okay. Red hair. Red hair. Trying to find. It just went away. Why does it do this to me? Okay. So we don't know the percentage worldwide that has depression, but a good thing to think about is 7% of the U.S. alone has depression. Red hair, only 2% of the people have worldwide. So we think about that. It's more common to be depressed than to have red hair. That's something to think about, because you see redheads everywhere. Like, I I know so many people with red hair naturally, and I'm sure some people dye it, so you can't really tell if they really do or not, but I know so many redheads, and um, this is more common than red hair. Um, I think I know maybe one person who has not attempted suicide at least once. Um, I didn't, I don't, yeah, one person. Uh, I typically don't know anyone whose parents stay together or has, hasn't attempted suicide or anything like that. And people are like, maybe that's a crowd you're hanging out with. But honestly, I think people are a lot less common. Uh, they don't want to say it, for of course, for the stigma. But uh, I think 
a large majority of people, much, much more than is diagnosed, has considered suicide at least once. Maybe not attempted it, but has considered it. I think it's very underdiagnosed. I mean, there's a large, large majority of people who they're like, oh, they didn't even have depression. Well, they just killed themselves. It could be a depression. It may not be de clinical depression, as I mentioned. But I think that a lot of people have more depression than lets on. Uh, I know my first press, uh, my first suicide attempt was when I was 14. And that one actually was due to depression, not clinical depression. Um, I have no issue sharing this with you. Uh, I was raped by my family. And so I wanted to get rid of it. So, of course, um, next attempt was probably 15. Another rape case. Um, 16. It's pretty much been every year. Um, 16, my attempt was... Um, that's when my mental illness has started to kick in more. My anxiety especially. I went and read of that. Um, 17. There was a lot of crap going on, but honestly, it was more clinical at that point. Um, it was like three or four tries when I was 17. But, uh, yeah, it's been a common thing. I mean, people do all sorts of things. People always think of the gun to the head or to the, the rope on your neck. Honestly, most people don't do those. Uh, maybe those are the ones that get TV, but they're not really that common, as far as I, I'm aware of. People I know who have attempted suicide don't try those methods. Um, like, I'll find a problem. I'm not saying try these methods, obviously, but um, let's see, like, I slit my throat and squeeze it to try to get the blood out. Uh, I bash my head against the bed, trying to get myself to die. Um, I see. I've drank bleach. I downed a bunch of cologne because I thought it says don't ingest. Maybe it'll help. Um. Let's see. Tried. I've tried so many things. I'm trying to think of which ones are. I did a lot of self-harm. I'm trying to think which ones were actually intended to kill myself and not like you accidentally self-harm too much. Um, let's see. I drank a lot of pineapple juice because I'm deathly allergic to it. So people, I mean, there's plenty more things, but basically people get creative. It's not just like a rope or a gun to your head. You know, they go to their allergies. It's a really common one too. Um, because those they can play off as an accident if they don't die. They can be like, Oh man, uh, I didn't know I was allergic, or I didn't know that drink had pineapple juice in it, or whatever it might be. Because you can play it off and not be forced to get help. It's not an attempted suicide, then, it's an allergic reaction. And you don't get as much attention over it, because people don't want the attention. I'll be like, oh, they're depressed because they want attention. Most people I know do not want you looking at them, they don't want any attention. They're trying to sort their own things out. They can't explain it to themselves, how could they explain it to you? They just want to be alone and figure this out themselves. They don't want to talk, they don't want to think, they just want to be alone. Sometimes it's just numb. And there are people who do want to get attention, typically in the beginning stages, or towards the very end. And don't negate that. Um, they want attention because they know they're going to do something really bad, and they want someone to notice to stop them from doing it. Um, like, I got to the point where I stopped wearing long sleeves, because originally I would wear long sleeves to cover up all my self-harm scars, I didn't want anyone to notice, and towards the end I stopped wearing long sleeves, and I stopped, you know, started putting my hands on my desk and being like, you know, things like that, trying to show off a bit, to try to convince myself, like, if there's at least one person that cares, then maybe you're not as bad as they think, like, you know, you're hearing people say that you're horrible, and things like that. You mentally think you're horrible. 
you feel horrible, things are going bad. There's at least one person that generally is like, whoa, are you, are you okay? Then you're like, maybe I'm not trash. I at least am important enough for some stranger to notice, or a friend to notice. And so a lot of people don't want the attention, but some people definitely want it, and they need it. Those are typically more the ones who have multiple illnesses. Um, or of ones who may have schizophrenia or bipolar or something else. And they're hearing voices in their head telling them they're horrible. Or they have an abusive home life and they're telling people are telling them they're horrible. And they just need someone out there to say that they care about them. And that it's okay. And they'll get over it. and Not get over it, but you know, they'll get through it. And so don't be like they just want attention. Yeah, they probably do. So give them that attention, you know. Um, it's not as common now, which I'm glad about. But um, when I was growing, growing up around middle school era, era, um, people, you know, were like, "Oh, I'm so cool. I'm a scene. Scene was the biggest thing. Where you cut your wrist because the stars did it, and you want to be like them." And that was probably the era that made people not take depression seriously, which is why a lot of times now people don't take depression seriously. Like, it's a style, it's a style choice. But then, some people really were depressed and really did kill themselves. But, because it was a style, people didn't see the warning signs, get help. They were like, you've cut us all over your wrist, but, you know, the band musicians were like, slit my wrist, feel depressed, everything else. And I think their message was trying to get part of how they feel. Um, maybe an attention grab, like I was mentioning, for getting help. Or just to be like, does someone else feel the way I do? Well, other people took it as slit my wrist and everything else, and they're like, so that's cool, I want to do that. I want to be like that guy. And now people are being very, very good about um, things. Stars are coming out and saying about how depression is important. Um, they're talking against self-harm. They're talking against anorexia. They're helping out in all types of things. I don't hear any song nowadays that's about um, cutting yourself or hurting yourself or suicide, which was very common when I was in middle school. They're being very, uh, very good with their music. And if they feel such a way, they're making sure they come across in a way of... Uh, I need to get help or something like that. They don't go about being like, this is cool. Or they may say in an interview, this is a very important song personally because of this reason. And they'll, they'll set themselves straight. Uh, I have not heard a lot of depression songs in a long time. Recently, actually, I did hear a depression song. Um, uh, I completely forget what it's called. But I was like really surprised to hear it. But it's a completely different track. And before it was like, we're cool, we slit our wrist, whatever. And he's more about how he's depressed. He thinks he doesn't deserve to live. Things are going bad. And towards the end of the song, he's like, I realize that things aren't as bad as I think they were. I have people who care about me. Things are going to get better. I don't want to die anymore. Things are okay. So it's like he sets himself straight in his own song. He talks about reaching out for help. And he gets help in the song. Like, it's a big song about that. Really wish I could find the name of it because it's a really good song. It's actually a rap, which you don't typically find raps that are pro mental health. So it's it's really good. Really got awareness there. But um, but yeah, it's it's community has changed a lot. Uh, it's more acceptable to come out as having depression now. So people are like, there's too many people with depression now. They're Everyone's has depression now, and it's more of, they still had depression back then, but now it's not seen as an attention thing, they're trying to actually get help. And a lot of people in the older generations especially still view it as an attention grab, but uh, the, the millennials especially, Generation Z's, you know, still coming up in there, but millennials especially realize, you know, that mental health is insanely important. And we're going to help you get help, because the way it seems to be to me, and to most millennials I've talked to, we're kind of viewed as that we're a team. 
uh, baby boomers um, and all the older generation typically are more of like, this is the way I was raised, this is the way I'm going to do it for you, this is the way I'm going to do it for my kids, this is the way I'm going to do it for my grandkids. Like, this is the way it has always been. Whereas millennials are more of, I grew up in a horrible situation, I never want my family to have to be with that. I'm going to be better than that. Um, I don't want, you know, my school life was really bad. And yeah, that's the way it's always been, but maybe it shouldn't be that way. And you know, things like that, they're more of viewing that things aren't the way they should be. And trying to help for mental illness especially has been a big one they've reached into. Which is amazing. Like, um, geez, if you asked me years ago to come out of schizophrenic, no way I would have come out of schizophrenic. I would have been locked up that night. I would have been all this test on me. Um, my parents would disown me on site. Uh, if they hadn't already, I mean, they disowned me for being trans. But, you know, um, like I would have been ostracized from my community. I wouldn't be able to work at a job. Like, now my boss knows I'm schizophrenic, and if I'm having a bad episode, he says, you know, you can sit to the side and, you know, recalibrate. And, you know, they would have never done that before. They would have been like, sucks to be you, uh, or would have been thinking we're violent. It's the most common one. Um, so I know I've talked about many illnesses and not just focusing on depression, and that is because it is a very core mil quote, comorbid. I don't know why I can't pronounce that word right. I think it's the accent. But um, it's a very comorbid uh, thing, whereas most illnesses typically have depression. I mean, bipolar has depression in one of the poles. Um, schizophrenia, usually you hear voices who are very cruel to you, so you have depression due to that. Um, anxiety, you're, you know, I told you about that one. Um, uh, multiple personalities, you have depression because no one seems to understand you. Uh, disassociative identity disorder, which is very close to multiple personalities. Some people say the same thing. There is a slight difference between the two. Um, I won't go too much into that, but basically, they have changed the name of multiple personality disorder to disassociative identity disorder. But disassociative disorder is a whole other thing. So the fact they add identity in it, it just makes them bleed over too much. Like, I even used the wrong one. I said identity is different, but it's identity is multiple personalities, whereas regular disassociative is something else completely. So it's pretty confusing there. But um, those you typically have uh, anxiety and stuff and depression because they can't, they don't understand you. PTSD, I'm sure you can see the depression from that. Actually, the new name of PTSD is actually PTSS. Um, People don't know. PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, has been changed to post-traumatic stress syndrome. And people wondering about that, um, they're going to try to change more things like that. But disorder is a physical issue in your brain. Um, that has always kind of been that way. Syndrome means something happened to you to make it this way. And in psychology, it's such a hard line to you. Because, like, again, depression, you know, major depressive disorder or clinical depression, as more commonly they're called. It's considered disorder because the hormone balance is still. But I told you how it can be started due to a traumatic experience. So, you know, is it both? Is it neither? I think that's why I more focused on saying clinical depression instead of major depressive disorder. Also, it's shorter. Um, so there's a big line of they're trying to change things. They're trying to get synced up with medical, which is a big deal because... Doctors are prescribing MAOIs and stuff with no, no, you know, um, they don't tell you about diet and stuff are important, like I was telling you about. Um, my doctor prescribed me bipolar medication, which apparently uh, is a huge no-no. Um, the psychology department has been, like, fighting this for years to not let them do that. I didn't know that. I just went in and said I needed some, and they gave me some. I didn't even have to do a test or anything. They just handed it over to me. So, big no-no there. Um, I do want to brush on the um, bipolar factor here, which I mentioned in my bipolar video. But I'll brush more on it here, since you may not have watched that one. If you have any history in your family of bipolar disorder, 
whether it's your great 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 grandma or whatever, be very very careful. Um, a large large majority, like seventy eighty percent of people whose family had bipolar, um, uh, will get bipolar. And why am I saying this is an important thing? Um, antidepressants are not good for bipolar people, which is why I told you I can't take antidepressants because I have bipolar. Uh, they will kickstart mania, which, uh, to get it short, that's more of a reckless state. Everything is perfect, you're gonna go off and do whatever, no conscious in your mind. Uh, there's no voice in your head telling you no. And it's basically, they view it as the opposite pole of depression for bipolar, two poles. Um, but be very careful. Um, it can also trigger a mode where you have all this energy, but you're still insanely depressed. It's like a weird crossover thing. So instead of being too tired to even commit suicide or anything, now you have all this energy, but you still want to die. So what happens? I'm sure you can guess. Um... They're trying very, very, very hard for the medical community to not be allowed to prescribe antidepressants. But then it gets to the point, people who need them can't get them because it's very, 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 very expensive to get a psychologist. And you typically have to see them for months and months and months before they'll prescribe you anything, even antidepressants. So, you know, so much of a fight. Whereas a doctor, you pay 50 60 sometimes two hundred dollars just to get an appointment or so sometimes free if you have insurance and you get your medication that day you go pay like five bucks to get it from the store perfect psychologists are like five hundred dollars an appointment and they have to see you at least once a week for at least a month sometimes six months for some of them like to start testosterone i just see them for at least a year uh, so very very expensive Easily in the thousands of dollars. I'm very lucky my school had free counseling. So if you are ever offered free counseling, please take it. Um, even if you don't think you have any illness or anything, it helps to test anxiety. Helps to basic stress, daily stress. You may not have uh, clinical anxiety or clinical depression, but there's things that make you upset, and you just need someone to talk to. Maybe you can't talk about how, you know, man, I was really upset that. Um, my sister didn't come and hang out with me. But you can't talk to your friends about that because they'll just be like, you like your sister? Ew, you know. And maybe not like that severe, but, um, you know, a lot of people, they're like, things hit them harder um, than they let on. Men especially. And I'm not trying to exclude women, of course, but in society, we're taught as women that you're emotional, you're rational, whatever else. So you may hide up your emotions to seem strong, but around other women, you can show your emotion. Whereas men, you don't show your emotions for anything. You don't cry in front of your girlfriend, even. You don't cry in front of your family. You don't cry in front of your friends. If someone found out you cried at all, even at, like, a funeral, they'd mock you forever. Um, you don't show emotions at all. You don't talk about mental illness. You don't talk about anything. You're the strong man. You're there to comfort the woman when she's having her emotional issues. That's it. You don't have your own emotional issues. You have anger, and that's it. And that is uh, a society that we've been having uh, all around the world, honestly. Men are taught to be strong. Men don't cry. Um, you know, you can have the tea set. That's for a girl. And I'm not saying that it's not the other way as well. You know, women are taught, you know, you can't be tough. You're a girl. You be like a little cheerleader or whatever else. But it's becoming more open for women. Women are getting more into business jobs. They're getting more into, um, they're still not as paid as well. But, you know, it's not seen as bad for women, for a woman or a little girl to get, like, a G.I. Joe or something. Or to get a fake gun or something. Whereas a boy, you can't get a Barbie. You can't get a magic wand. What's wrong with you? Um, and so I don't want us to be more of, like, a lot of people are like, you know, pro-women, pro-women, anti-men, and that's not what it needs to go to. It needs to be pro-everyone. Everyone happy. And it's hurting uh, the trans community pretty pretty hard, um, as you can imagine. The males, uh, you know, transitioned to male, uh, we're having it 
fairly easy in a way. You know, it's more accepted for someone who may not be. If people still think we're girls, they were able to pass, you know, being like, okay, it's just a tomboy, whatever. But someone who doesn't look 100% female yet, um, they're wearing a dress or something, they get beat up and usually killed. For us, you know, they may call you a dyke and you may get beat up, but typically that's not as common as getting beat up for wearing a dress when they think you are a man, you know, you're a woman. So I know I know people who are afraid to come out of the closet because they are women inside, but they're purposely growing out longer beards and making their voice deeper around people because they are so scared of being viewed as anything that they are. They don't want to get beat up. They don't want to die. And I didn't try to make this into a trans thing, but I'm more of going to the point where uh, these little boys, you know, if they want to have a princess wand or something, Maybe they're actually a girl. Maybe they're not. Maybe they're just a man who likes princess stuff. That's fine. Maybe they'll grow out of it. Maybe they won't. You don't know. But it's really hindering the trans community the fact that, um, you know, from a young age, they're taught to do not like anything female. So when they actually think they're girls, and are girls, of course, it's hurting them because they're starting to think that they're broken. And a lot of trans think that in general, but it tends to hit the females more common, I think. It tends to be a lot more hate crimes against the females. So obviously there's a lot of depression there as well, which ties it into the video. But, um, but yeah, um, that's a very important PSA there. Um, as I mentioned, the ones transitioning to male, you know, it's a little easier to start off as, but it's a lot harder... You're instantly viewed as gay, usually, when you don't really look masculine. Like, even now I look, they call me a twink, or, um, you know, they think I'm really young or something, because I'm so tiny. I'm short, I'm skinny, I have some muscles now, which I didn't have about a year ago, but I'm tiny, and I have a higher voice, and, um, you know, whatever else, uh, so they view you as gay, typically, um. Unless it's your body type, but, um, so if you, so you can beat up for being gay, or they think you are gay, even if you're not, and showing any emotion, like we're taught that we're allowed to do as females, now you show emotion and you get beat up, and you're like, so you have to, like, kind of reuse the society, which we shouldn't have to do. Society itself should be accepting of both men and women showing emotion. You know, no need to hide it or anything else of that nature. Because, you know, everyone has emotions. Why hide them? So, if you think you need help, you know, reach out to anyone. Anyone. Reach out to me. Reach out to a stranger on Tumblr. Reach out to Facebook. Reach out to your family. Go and see counseling without telling anyone. A lot of people do that. And they're too ashamed of it to tell any of their friends or family. That's okay. Tell them you're at rugby practice if you want to. Or they have a lot of homework tonight or something like that. that that's fine. Get the help you need, whether... Other people accept it or not. We can't afford it. Um, so when you go to friends or Tumblr or something like that, I've met some amazing online friends that you know have helped me through some difficult times. Um, watching YouTubers, uh, I don't want to sound like all conceited here now, but um, Jack and Mark, Mark Flyer and Jack Septic Eye, if you don't know, um, they talk a lot about um, getting the help. You are worth it. Things like that. They do a lot of charities things like that, and it just makes you feel needed. You're helping out with charity, or um, you are great. And they'll personally answer your questions a lot of times and make you feel included in the community, and then you're like, and you may not be, like, the most popular person in the community, but you're like, he acknowledged me at least once. He might be wondering what happened to me if I don't talk again. And I'm not going out to be, like, advertising for them or anything else. There's all types of YouTubers, there's all types of Tumblr users, there's all types of people. Find a group that helps you feel better. Uh, if you want to, you can email me, you can text me. Um, you can comment on my video, and I will give out my phone number. I have no issue doing that. I'm not going to say it in the video, because uh, I'm sure there's bots who will spam me. But uh, if you actually need help or anything, I will gladly give it out. 
Uh, I have Twitter. Seek me out on Twitter. It's at uh, TFCOM598. Seek me out on Twitter. I will gladly private chat you. Um, if you don't want to talk, you don't want to talk, like, talk, talk, and you want to just text, that's fine, too. Actually, I prefer that. Um, I will definitely reach out. I will, I can't know you need help to reach out to you if you don't reach out to me. But you are important. You are needed. Um, don't think you're not. Okay? I know I'm just some random guy talking on online, but I've been through a lot, and I know that it's hard to come out of it. And don't take that to be like, oh, he went through all these rape things, and I just had this happening. Nothing is negated. You know, if you're really upset about something, it doesn't matter. You know, a splinter for one person is a bullet for another. It doesn't matter if it's not that thing. Like, failing a test may be someone's worst thing ever. But for someone else, it's like, oh, whatever, I failed a test. It doesn't matter if you think you're not, you're upset, re your reason you're upset is not important. Because it is. And you're important. I don't want you guys to forget that. So reach out if you need help. I'll gladly talk to you. Um, I'll try to find resources for you, if possible. Uh, it can be from anything. It can be depression, it can be anxiety, it can be schizophrenia, bipolar. Um, you can be coming out of strands and you're needing help about that. I know all that. I, I'm not an expert, obviously, but I am a psych I am a psych graduate. It's weird to say that it's not major. instead of major. Graduate with a psych degree. I do have personal experience, family and myself. Uh, I'm fairly in pretty into the um, trans community here in Tyler, or East Texas in general. There's a pretty good trans community that I'm part of. I know people can help you get your name changed. Uh, I can I can help you with anything, and if I can't help you with it, I can help you find someone who can. So, don't think options are out. You're out of options, okay? You'll always get help. Something will happen, and you'll be okay. It may take years. Don't let that discourage you. You will be okay. Alright, I feel like I've ranted long enough now. Keep calm, signing off.